Morning everybody, my name's Josh um, and today we're going to be looking, continuing looking through Philippians. Uh, so we're going to be looking at Philippians 1, 27 through to 30. Now some of you might know that my day-to-day -day job I work in architecture uh, and although I'd love to say that every project I work on is uh, proper exciting and is a masterpiece, that just wouldn't be true. But there are certain projects that are exciting, that stand out in my mind as projects that I'm quite proud of. And one of the projects that I was asked to work on was for a wildlife centre. Uh, and the first project that we did for the wildlife centre uh, was a polar bear enclosure. Now, after um, numerous months of uh, going through the process, we, we completed it and, the, and this polar bear enclosure was about to open. So we got invited along to the opening day uh, of, the, of the enclosure and they made a big, the, the wildlife centre made a big um, big thing about it. There was loads of people coming for this opening and before the opening we, we met in the uh, staff canteen and as I walked into the canteen uh, we were sat in, in a group with some of the uh, representatives from the centre uh, and the team that had worked on it and over in the corner of the canteen was probably about 10 or 15 men dressed up as kangaroos. Now, the, the outfits that they were wearing were pretty realistic and they were getting a bit of a briefing. So I said to one of the guys from the centre who was with us, like, what, what's going on? You know, why are these, why are these blokes dressed up as, as, uh, as kangaroos? And he said, well, We've, we've spent quite a lot of money on the polar bear enclosure, and um, probably more than we hoped. Um, so some of some of the um, animals we we just can't afford to to fill the, the spaces with real animals. So we just fill them with with men in suits if we can, if the the right size. Um, so it's like okay, it's a bit <laughs> a bit random. Um, but anyway, we. We went on with the day, we got to the polar bear enclosure, um, they were doing the opening, and I noticed that there was this kangaroo. Now, the kangaroos were in a certain enclosure, but this one particular kangaroo was uh, loving the attention he was getting from um, all, the, all the visitors. Um, so he was showing off, and he followed this group of visitors because he was getting attention from them. He followed them, and they actually come to the polar bear enclosure, and he's jumping around at the side of the polar bear enclosure, and the, the guys who were with, with me from the centre, the centre manager, uh, and a few of the other guys, they were going absolutely crazy. Like, what is this guy doing? Get someone, get this guy out and back into where he should be. In fact, just get him off the, off the site. Anyway, he was, he was absolutely loving it, bouncing around. And he actually fell into the polar bear enclosure. So he slid down the side, into, um, basically into the water where his polar bear was. And everybody starts screaming. People getting the cameras out, videoing it. Um, this guy screaming his head off, shout, "Help me, help me!" And that's freaking people out because there's kangaroos shouting, "Help me, help me!" Um, and it just turned into carnage. And the polar bear started heading straight towards him, and he's screaming even louder, "Get me out! Get me out!" And the sides are quite steep, so he couldn't climb out. And as the polar bear got over to him, he grabbed him by the shoulders and started shaking him, uh, which was a bit random for a polar bear to do. I thought he'd just like swipe him, but he grabbed him and shaking him. And the polar bear said, mate, if you don't shut up screaming, you're going to get us both sacked. Now, obviously, that's uh, not a true story. Um, well, some of it might be true, but uh, the, the guys dressing up as animals is, is not quite true. But I'll tell you that story for, for a reason. And, and that's that sometimes things aren't always what they seem to be. And sometimes we're not always what we appear to be. And we can, we can just be uh, wearing a mask or a kangaroo costume. But just like the kangaroo in that story, if we carry on pretending to be what we're not, we'll get caught out. And I think that's what Paul is warning about in the start of this passage. So I'm going to read it. It's uh, Philippians 1, 27 through to 30. And it says, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, 
without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So when, when I read this first bit in Philippians, um, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel, it kind of makes me think, is saying that if you say you're a Christian, then act and live out your life like that. Live out a life worthy of the gospel. Live your life in a consistent way to what you say that you believe in. And that's not always easy because life throws things up at us, it throws curveballs at us that try and knock us off our tracks. But I think Paul recognises that and he's got some amazing advice for us uh, that comes later on. And it's not enough to speak the gospel, we have to live it. But there was a time in my life when I could speak the gospel, I called myself a Christian, but I struggled to live it out. I think that's probably because I didn't think I was really worth it or worthy of it. I thought that I wasn't good enough. But then I realised that that's not true. We're all different. We've all lived different lives. Some of us uh, have had things happen in our lives that makes us think we don't deserve the forgiveness or the freedom or the acceptance that the gospel gives us. But you can take a £10 note, you can screw it up, you can spit on it, you can rub it in the dirt. But that £10 note is still worth £10. The dirt doesn't dictate its value. And I believe that the gospel is for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're screwed up, if you've been spat on, if you're covered in dirt. The dirt doesn't define you. You're still worthy of that sacrifice that Jesus made. You're still worthy of the gospel. Interestingly, when Paul says conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel, the translation for conduct yourself actually means to live as a citizen. So I think he's saying live like you're a citizen of heaven. Now, I used to work with a guy uh, called Juan from Argentina. Uh, and Juan was an amazing bloke. And we used to have loads of conversations about the differences between the Argentinian, Argentin Argentinian way of life and the British way of life. Uh, and although Juan lived in the UK, he was a citizen of Argentina. And the way he lived his life reflected that. And I think Paul was reminding the Philippians that they were actually citizens of heaven. They weren't citizens of Rome, they were citizens of heaven. And that's the same for us. We're not citizens of the UK, we're citizens of heaven. And citizenship of heaven isn't for something later. It's not reserved for when we're dead. But we can start living as citizens of heaven now and living out those characteristic, characteristics that come with that citizenship, which is a life worthy of the gospel. You see, the gospel is the way into citizenship. I can't say that word. Can I? The gospel is the way into citizenship, but it's also the way to live as a citizen. But like I said, living this out can be difficult. Anyone who thinks that becoming a Christian will give you a life without any ups and downs, without any tr uh, trouble, without any pain, is kidding themselves. Jesus told his disciples to pick up the cross and follow him. And I don't think he meant wear a cross around your neck or get a cross tattooed across your chest. I think he meant it's going to cost you to follow me. Be prepared to make sacrifices. If we choose to follow Jesus, it might cost us our reputation, our popularity, our friends, our jobs. But there's a joy on the other side of, of that cost, a joy that's like no other. It's a joy in knowing that you have hope through life's problems. It's a joy in knowing that the hope of the world is in Jesus and you have that hope in living inside you. When I got married to Esther, I wanted to get her something special as a gift for our wedding day. And Esther doesn't really wear jewellery, so I came up with this amazing idea that I'd buy her a pearl necklace. I thought it was a good idea until I saw the price. Uh, and to be fair, I couldn't really afford it. 
Um, but I really wanted to get her this gift. Um, so I made some sacrifices. It was far too expensive for me at the time, but I made some sacrifices, uh, cut down on what I was spending at the time and, and paid it off in installments. In fact, I think probably I'll just finish paying, paying it off after 12 years, to be fair. But I decided that that sacrifice would be worth it. And she wore it on our wedding day. Uh, and I thought, yeah, that, that sacrifice was worth it. I think that was the last time she actually wore it. So I, was, uh, I wasn't convinced that it was worth it at the time. Uh, but then something happened a few years ago that I wasn't expecting. I went upstairs uh, and noticed my eldest daughter in our bedroom. And she was trying on the necklace, looking in the mirror, uh, modeling, just and the joy on her face and the, um, the love and excitement for this necklace. And, and just just watching her uh, look at herself with this necklace on just filled me with a joy that I wasn't expecting. And that wasn't the joy that I was anticipating when I, I went through the sac sacrifice initially. And I'm sure the joy that we'll receive for any sacrifices we make now will far exceed our expectations. But I think Paul's advice here acknowledges that is going that it's going to be tough there's going to be tough sacrifices there's going to be challenges there's going to be difficult times in our lives we're, we're going to have people trying to put us down we're going to have battles to face but he says you don't have to do it alone he says then whether i come and see you or only hear about you in my absence I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for, faith, for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. And living a Christian life isn't meant to be done on your own. And that's one of the main things that I get from this passage. It's that they aren't citizens on their own. The part of a bigger community, a bigger family. And that family is full of random people with different backgrounds, different personalities, different opinions, but they're all united by one thing that they hold above everything else. They're all united by Jesus. And that's what leads them to strive together and live out their, their belief, their faith of the gospel together. The way that Paul writes this just reminds me of the people standing shoulder to shoulder, ready to take on anything together as a united front. Now, I love a bit of history, particularly around military battles and that sort of thing. And, and back in the day, the ancient Greeks used to have a special formation when they went into battle called the phalanx. So the phalanx was a large group of soldiers who literally fought shoulder to shoulder uh, with their shields overlapping each other, uh, and it was virtually impenetrable. Well, it was until the Romans came along with their legions, um, but because they would interlock their shields, the shield would half protect them and half protect the man to the side of them. And then there was a, a mass of blokes uh, behind pushing them, pushing them on, pushing them forward. But the phalanx was only strong whilst each man stood interlocked with the bloke next to them. And as soon as that link was broken, the phalanx became weakened. And this kind of, this kind of paints a picture for me of how Paul is telling the Philippians to behave, stand, standing shoulder to shoulder, protecting each other and pushing each other on from behind. And in today's culture, we have... Um, a very individualistic outlook. It's all about me, it's all about my life, my family, my dream, my hope, my job, my wealth, my future. And we have to remind ourselves that we're not just individuals. If we know Jesus, we're part of heaven, we're citizens of heaven, we're part of the church family. And it's very interesting that when Paul wrote this, he was isolated from the church in Philippi. He's locked down in his prison cell and is, uh, is concerned for the church. Uh, he's concerned for 
are they doing? Are they persevering in the faith? Are they following Jesus in their day-to-day -day lives? Are they watching out for each other? Have they got each other's backs? And I think we can all probably relate to this in some way at the minute. We're currently going through our third national lockdown. And I guess the danger is that this isolation can lead to a breakdown in relationships. And as we've as we're separated, it can it can lead to an independence and, and lose that support, encouragement and uh, accountability of being part of something much bigger. And I think at the minute there's that danger that people either feel like they're isolated or think they'll just ride it out on their own and, and go it alone. I think that's what Paul is warning us against here. Um, Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. I think there's also a warning here about staying united, not letting anything break our lines. And, and as we do that, we're stronger together and we don't have to be afraid of what we face because we've got each other's backs. You know, you know the, uh, the saying, every day is a school day. Well, recently I got uh, introduced to a uh, honey badger. Not literally introduced to a honey badger, but I'd never heard of a honey badger before uh, until someone told me about it. Um, absolutely crazy animal. If you've never heard of one, I'm sure most people have, uh, but if you've never heard of one, uh, just go onto YouTube and have a look at a honey badger. But the... I, that's what I did. I was looking at this honey badger, trying to find out what a honey badger was. Uh, and when the video finished on YouTube, the next clip uh, came on, which was a clip of um, two gazelles fighting. Now, there was this group of people that were on a, I assume they were on a safari, and they saw these two gazelles fighting each other. And the rest of the gazelles, I don't know what you call them, a herd or a pack, I don't know, were all st stood watching these two gazelles fighting each other. And then all of a sudden, in the distance, you just saw this lion just legging it towards it, just absolutely sprinting towards these two gazelles. And the rest of the, the gazelles, the herd, um, saw the lion running towards them. Um, so they, like any normal person would do when they see a lion running towards them, turned and legged it. They left the mates, left them there fighting each other, and they were off. They, they legged it. But these two gazelles had not noticed this lion. They were that uh, engrossed in fighting each other. They had not noticed this lion running towards them. Um, and the lion just got closer and closer. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, being quiet at all. He was absolutely just pelting forwards at these gazelles. Um, and he got one. He, he caught one, one ran off, and uh, one of the gazelles ended up getting to know that lion in a way that he probably didn't want to. But we have to make sure we don't do the same thing as these gazelles. When, we've, when we're fighting each other, we lose sight of the danger around us. We lose sight of the enemy prowling, ready to pounce. We also can't be like the gazelles that just stand and watch. And, and when they see a bit of danger, they leg it and leave the mates to get chewed up. We've got to stay united uh, and watch each other's backs. And I guess, one of the dangers that we face at the minute in this period of lockdown, but to be honest, any time, is that we drift away. We drift away from each other. We drift away from God. We can get so consumed in our own problems, our own life, uh, and all of a sudden, we don't have time any, anymore to, to look at our Bible, to spend time with God, to spend time with our church community. But Paul says, no, stay together, live as one, support each other, encourage each other, plug into home rooms, plug into the church, plug into community, and let's support each other. We're not citizens of England or Ireland or Wales or wherever we come from. We're citizens of heaven. And that citizenship is open to anyone. It's not just for a select few. It's not just um, for certain people. It doesn't matter how dirty you are. It doesn't matter what's gone on in your life. That citizenship is open to you. 
And even better, the gospel says that it's free. The price has been paid for your citizenship. And that's the hope that we live with, the hope that Jesus gives us. So hope you have a, a, a great day. Um, let's keep encouraging each other. Let's keep plugging in to, to church. Let's keep watching each other's backs. Take care. God bless.
working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. We'll sing it again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship.
them praise tonight. Amen.